Okay, today we are going to work through two more examples of entropy in action. One is a little bit uh, simple and fast, but really should make you think about how the world works. And the second one is everyone's favorite entropy example, the Carnot cycle. So let's start out by making some ice. All right, so we want to make ice, or maybe you are imagining you are running a skiing operation and you want to run the snowmaker. And so uh, let's look at the energy and entropy balances for making ice and figure out how that works. Uh, so I want you to think about, to work out the entropy change for making ice. Actually, more specifically, I want you to work out the temperature at which it's possible to make ice reversibly. So we haven't talked about phase changes a lot, so I just want to remind you how the energy and the entropy balances work for phase changes. An energy balance here is really looking at um, a sensible heat change and the enthalpy change related to the change in phase. So if we don't have a temperature change, we're just looking for this phase change to happen we are, our energy balance is quite simply delta H equals Q. We're assuming we have an open system. And that delta H that we're gonna use is the delta H of fusion, um, which is the energy change for going from solid to liquid uh, for any material. And in this case, uh, when you are going from liquid to solid, that becomes a negative value because we need to remove that energy from the system. Okay, so that's the energy balance. The entropy balance, uh, isn't simplified in any way at all, actually. So we have a delta S. That, again, will be the delta S of fusion because uh, it's a state change. We're looking for what happens with this state change. Um, and then on the other side of the equation that's balanced with Q over T, we know we have Q because there was Q in the energy balance. That's how we're getting energy out of the system. Um, T is the temperature at which this occurs, at which heat exchange happens here. So that's what you want to know. I've looked up and I got for you the numerical value for the delta S of fusion. You can look up the delta H of fusion yourself for, for water, um, right? We have to be careful what's going on. And now remember S gen, not a thing we can calculate any other way, but to have figured out the Q over T and the delta S. Um, and then what's left over is S gen. So I want you to mess around with the entropy equation and tell me approximately, what temperature you expect it is possible for water to freeze. This should be a familiar number. Uh, note that there was some rounding in the uh, delta S effusion I gave you, so you might get something a couple tenths of a degree off from what you expect, but you should get just about what you expect. And then um, I want you to reflect on the fact that the energy balance doesn't say anything about temperature. So the energy balance says, go ahead, freeze water at any temperature, so then think about what does the entropy balance tell us about when it's possible to freeze water. And then let's go on to our next problem. Okay, so this is a big old problem and you've seen this one before, um, almost certainly in PCHEM, possibly in some other places. Uh, we are gonna look at the Carnot cycle. The Carnot cycle uh, was first postulated by Sadie Carnot, who was uh, a French engineer and uh, as the most efficient possible uh, engine, heat engine, uh, that could be made. And it turns out he was right. So we look at this not because it's practical to build, because you can't actually make one of these that works sensibly for a variety of reasons that we'll talk about in class, uh, but it is useful as a point of comparison. How well is the engine that you have made or the system you have made doing by comparison to the theoretical best? So for our Carnot cycle, I'm going to ask you to write uh, expressions for and determine numerically delta H, W, S, Q, and delta S for each step in the cycle. And I want you to find the overall efficiency at turning heat in into work out. And I want you to draw this on a PV and TS diagram just to get an idea of what's happening. Uh, we're going to treat this Carnot cycle a little bit different from what you've probably seen before. The classical presentation is as a closed system in a piston cylinder. We're going to think about it as an open system that's uh, cycling through a number of unit operations. Um, mathematically uh, similar, but this is uh, better for you to get used to thinking like a chemical engineer. So step one, 
isothermal expansion from state A to state B. Okay, so we're going to expand, and we, we uh, the classical presentation is as an ideal gas, so we're going to do that again here. Uh, step two, we take that same st process stream, and we adiabatically expand it, so two expansion steps in a row, from state B to state C. Okay, step three, we go from, uh, we, we take state C and we isothermally compress uh, to state D. And then step four is an adiabatic compression. So two expansion steps, two compression steps, and it's gonna take us from state D all the way back around to state A. So there's a couple of things embedded in the Carnot cycle that, that are a little bit subtle, so I wanna make sure I call these out for you. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're gonna assume our working fluid here is an ideal gas. Uh, so that means you're gonna to have to calculate all of this stuff by hand. It's not gonna be something you can work out using the steam tables. But you have all of these back doors that you need um, in your textbook and in previous problems you solve. We're gonna treat it like an open system, so we're using delta H instead of delta U. Um, and we assume uh, every step is reversible. That is fundamental to the Carnot cycle. The other interesting thing that's fundamental to the Carnot cycle is if you look carefully at what's happening, we've only got two temperatures in this entire system, right? Because those two isothermal steps don't change temperature. Um, the adiabatic steps must change temperature. But the adiabatic steps being followed and preceded by isothermal steps means that we have pretty much a hot temperature uh, on, on one side of this and then a cold temperature on the other side. So for us to work this out, I'm gonna give you the, the hot temperature of 373 and the cold temperature of 298. Um, I'm working in K to make it easier for us to work with ideal gases. Also, um, I'm gonna have to mention that uh, when the energy enters our system, um, we are going to absorb uh, a thousand joules. And that'll be kind of our basis for how much energy is coming in. Uh, 